Welcome everyone to episode five of our finance for entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship series with Ted. Uh, welcome, Ted. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good, Donnie. How are you? You're looking very yeah, well. Not too bad. Yeah, I'm doing a little bit of branding, a bit of a branding exercise today um, with my excellent, with excellent. That's, that's always good to see. <laughs> so um, last time we talked about um, about debt financing. You know, how do you finance your business using debt? And now we want to talk about um, directors and the guys that run the business or the people that Absolutely. run the business. Um, so what, what are the roles and responsibilities of directors, Ted? Let, let, let's jump straight into it. Okay. So, um, uh, so welcome, uh, Donnie, welcome everybody. Uh, yeah, we're going to talk about the roles and responsibilities of a director. And I just want to reference back actually to, I think it was our first workshop, our, our first little talk, Tony, when we were talking about how a company is financially structured. And we talked about the shareholders and the directors. Now, lots of people who are watching may well be both. Uh, they may be the owner and the director, and they may be the sole owner and the sole director. They may be uh, uh, one of a number of owners, a number of shareholders, but the only director. They may be the only shareholder, but one of a number of directors. OK, and, and I think it's important that we make this distinction. So often uh, we hold two hats. Donna, you own your own business and you're a director of your business. I own my business. I'm a director of my business. And sometimes we get muddled as to which hat we are wearing. So it's very important that we're going to be talking about the role of the director and we need to make sure that as a director we're acting in the best interests of the company and we need to make sure that we are uh, separated and operating at arm's length from the owners from the shareholders yeah um a couple of documents i just want to mention and uh often these are set up when you set up your company and uh if you're like me you probably just kind of click the button that said give me a standard set of memorandum and articles and then off we go but um so companies act is is the legal is the legislation that, that dictates what companies can and can't do here in the uk there'll be a similar one uh, around the world in different countries the memorandum of association and the articles of association are the two key uh, uh, documents uh, at incorporation of a company. The memorandum of association, known as MOA, is like the root document of the company. So this is kind of like the constitution uh, and is subordinate to the Companies Act. So this is kind of this is the Magna Carta uh, if you're here in the UK or the constitution if you're in the US uh, for your company. It kind of just sets out what you can and can't do. Uh, so you may find, for example, that if you're running a mining company, you can't suddenly start producing Coca-Cola because the memorandum says we don't do Coca-Cola, we do um, uh, 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 mining. And you can obviously change them if necessary. The articles of association are then a subset. They are they're subordinate to the memorandum and they really will give the rules and the regulations. So they will govern the kind of the internal affairs and the management of the business. So that'll be things like, you know, we have to have three directors, we need to kind of divide it like this, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the kind of, you know, the, um, uh, uh, you know, the key sort of day-to-day -day management of the business. Yeah. Okay. So two documents, uh, as I said, um, you know, my company has them. I, I can't remember what's in them. I set them up, you know, many, many years ago. But if you're starting to run it for multiple shareholders and multiple directors, then it's probably worth um, making sure that you understand these documents. So what we're going to look at here is, is really six aspects. We're going to look at the appointment of directors, what powers they have, what we call a fiduciary, which is a kind of a um, sort of a, 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 a moral responsibility and then a legal responsibility. Talk a little bit about some of the penalties and then how we can protect ourselves as directors. OK, great. So, so who appoints a director, Ted? So it's the shareholders who appoint the directors. So uh, every company must have one director. Um, it is appointed by the shareholders. And it, what they do is, is set out in the Articles of Association, as we, as we, as we mentioned. Um, I think when we talked about shadow direct, uh, uh, when we talked about uh, structuring a company, we talked about the role of executive and non-executive directors. Do you, do you remember the difference between an executive and a non-executive? Um, no, Ted, Ted can, you, can you remind me? OK, so an executive uh, has day to day responsibility of running the business. Uh, they are executing the strategy. The non-executive are holding the executive to account and maybe providing advice. So typically, if 
if I'm an investor in your business, Donny, I may actually appoint myself or a colleague of mine to be an investor director. They would typically be a non-executive. There's somebody who's on the other end of the phone. Uh, you can phone up, you can ask advice. They'll kind of crack the whip when you're not hitting your targets, um, but they're not involved day to day in the business. Great. But whether you're an executive or a non-executive, you still have the same legal responsibilities as a director. So very important to understand that. Yeah. A shadow director is somebody who acts as if they're a director, but they're not actually appointed on company's house. And if you are acting in the company as a shadow director, you are, to all intents and purposes, treated as a director in the eyes of the law. So, Donnie, if you come to me and you ask my advice and I give you my advice, that's fine as a consultant. But if we're actually sitting down with board meetings and I'm influencing you in the strategic direction of your business, then in the eyes of the law, I'm starting to act like a shadow director. Right. And would that be down? Would so that be become, down to, sorry, Ted, just a question there. So would that be down in the minutes of the meeting? Um, so well, it's it's worth it's worth reflecting that in the minutes. So what we would do is, is it would it would be shown in the minutes so in order to avoid it uh, and we'll come on to kind of minutes a little bit later on but it's important that your your meetings that you're taking minutes and when you're voting it's only the directors the appointed directors are voting Great. so for example if all the appointed directors vote we do a and the uh, individual who's not a director says we should do b and we all do b they're clearly a shadow director they are clearly influencing the strategic direction of the business okay so often we'll put minutes in that says, you know, Fred or you know Joanna turned up at the meeting. They provided advice. The board considered it. Joanna then left, and then the board voted, uh, you know, to you know go with it or not go with it. For example, okay. So just making sure the minutes are are, are sort of structured in that way can avoid any problems further down the line. Um, it's worth making sure sure that you know you don't have individuals who are debarred from being a director so often directors uh, uh, individuals are up to shenanigans and no good and they get barred from being um, uh, a director so make sure that um, no, no, nobody who's been appointed uh, has been barred um, and all directors uh, have to be filed with companies house so uh, here in the UK you actually have to uh, formally appoint them and, and you have to notify companies house um, so that it can be held in the register um, and if you look at any company on companies house you'll be able to see the list of directors okay great um next one think about the powers of directors so again this is where we will be checking our articles of association um the key here is that um directors are expected to, to take reasonable care skill and diligence now i put reasonable in inverted commas because that's a really difficult um uh, a difficult word to define um so you are meant to be um, you're meant to be keeping yourself informed with the business and you're meant to be making reasonable decisions. So, Donnie, if you were to say, um, you know, I, I'm sure that you are making reasonable decisions in running your business. But if you decided to take all of the money out of your bank account um, uh, when you knew that you had to pay HMRC and tax and you put it all into Bitcoin, uh, for example, or you put it all on red in Las Vegas, we could argue well bitcoin maybe is a diff, a, a bad example but you know we could certainly start to argue are you taking reasonable care skill yeah. and due diligence is that reasonable to uh, uh, invest the money in red with the hope of being able to you know pay the tax bill and pay a big uh, uh, dividend um you do have liabilities for the actions of your fellow directors so there's this concept of of, of uh, 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 collective responsibility and i think the point there is that um you can't just say, oh, I didn't know something. So it's really important as a director that you understand the business that you are working for. Uh, and you can't just say, well, I'm a director of this bit over here uh, and, and Joanna is looking at this bit over here. And so if that bit goes wrong, it's not my problem. It's yeah. you have a, a reasonable responsibility to understand and to manage the whole business so you've got to be informed about the company's affairs you don't have to do it in detail you don't have to know every single nidget, uh, widget and and a dollar that's spent but you need to be familiar with your business that's really important because uh are there, are, are, there, are there any examples of people who aren't uh, who aren't aware of their business ted 
Well, there are. And I'm going to show you a little clip a little later on, Donny, of, a, of a, a director who ended up in front of the Treasury Select Committee, who was the chairman of a business. And he thought that his role as chairman was kind of, you know, just big, overarching, big picture. Um, and well, I'll, I'll show you the clip and you can yeah. draw um, your own conclusion as to whether you think that he was reasonably informed about the company's affairs. So and again, we talk about reasonably, we talk about, I think there's a legal concept of the man on Clapham Omnibus. So what would the man on the on the bus uh, uh, driving through, would he feel is reasonable in terms of understanding your business? As I think, if you're if you're running a multinational business, you can't know every single you know every single detail, but you've yeah. got to be reasonably informed. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll look at an example of that later on. Good good question. Um, fiduciary. So these are the, your some of your fiduciary responsibilities. So remember, we talked about this company as a separate legal entity, and you are working for that entity. Okay, so you are running a company, and you are running it on behalf of the shareholders, and you're running it on behalf of the shareholders as a whole. So if you have a majority shareholder, you cannot act in the favor of the majority shareholder if it's at the disadvantage of the minority shareholders. Yeah. Okay, so you have to think about the, 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 the shareholders as a whole, not individually. And you also need to consider other stakeholders, suppliers, customers, the staff, um, uh, uh, your corporate social responsibility, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you have a duty of care to all of these individuals. So you've got to protect the company's reputation. You may remember Gerald, Gerald Ratner. You remember him, Donny? Uh, no, I don't know, Ted. So Gerald Ratner was our friend who was in charge of um, uh, Ratner's jewellery. And he stood up in front of a bunch of, in fact, it happened to be his company, uh, but he stood up in front of a bunch of journalists and actually said his product was, and I quote him, crap. Uh, and obviously <laughs> that completely destroyed his company's reputation just like that. And the company went out of business. So you have a responsibility to protect your company's reputation. You can't start, you know, putting it or defaming it on um, social media. You're not allowed to profit at the company's expense. OK, now that's not to say that you can't supply goods and services, but you need to be careful that, you know, you're not actually, you know, taking money out, for example. And, and this is where, for example, Dominic Chappell got into trouble with his BA. He you know, bought BHS from Philip Green for a pound and then was charging millions of pounds worth of fees. And we ended up with, um, uh, uh, you know, the BHS go bust as a result. Um, yeah. So it's really important, finally, that the deals between directors and the company are, are uh, that, that, that you're declaring them. So when you sit down and you have your uh, business meetings that they're minuted and you're declaring your interest, whether that's your wife whose company is providing uh, a, a IT services, for example, uh, is doing the peer. Now, Donny, if if uh, it's just you, uh, then I doubt that you have business meetings with yourself and I doubt that you minute them, okay? And, and, and that's probably not a problem. But as soon as you've got more than one director, as soon as you've got more than one shareholder, you really need to formalize these. Make sure you're taking the minutes because otherwise you can get yourself into all sorts of problems. So you imagine two years down the line, I suddenly say, hey, Donny, hold on a sec. I just see that, you know, wife has been providing her services at a million pounds a day. And you go, yeah, 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 we agreed with that. And I go, no, we didn't agree with that. Well, if it's your word against mine, get it minuted. Get it minuted when it happens. And then you're less likely to f later further down the line. Yeah, really. I, th I think uh, this, this is the first point that you made about understanding that it's a different legal entity is very important because a lot of people tend not to understand that legal entity bit. Um, and the fact that when you have shareholders, you no longer have, you know, you have other people that you have to, to, to um, uh, be accountable to as well, right? You can't just do what you want anymore. So this goes back to that um, equity funding. For any time you take people's money and they become shareholders in business, you now have other people that you have to be accountable to. So it's really important to make, to understand Absolutely. that. Absolutely. And, and, and of course, you know, when we talk about other stakeholders, if you're using debt to fund the business, they're going to be part of those other stakeholders as well. And you actually have a legal responsibility to, to the debt providers to make sure that you can pay them and to the suppliers to make sure you can pay them. So yeah. once again, if you supply me with goods and services of a million dollars and then I pay my wife a million dollars uh, and then they donate you, I'm bust. 
you could say, well, hold on a sec. No, that that's you know we're gonna we're gonna uh, we're gonna um, uh, you know take legal action against you for not acting in the best interest of the company, for example. Yeah. Just a few uh, notes about responsibility. So we've kind of started to talk about these responsibilities. You've got to comply with company's law, um, with company law from your local jurisdiction, documents, the tax returns, the statutory accounts, that you're holding an annual general meeting with your shareholders. Now, Donnie, again, when was the last time you held an annual general meeting with yourself? Probably not. But as soon as you've got more than one director, more than one shareholder, you need to do this. Do, Give the right the notice to circulate the annual accounts. Sorry? Every year, every yeah, in some way exotic as well. Yeah. Absolutely, um, you know, and, and making sure applying with you know, there's silly little things like your business stationery has your um, head office address on it, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and your company number. In terms of penalties, so uh, it, it's worth bearing in mind a director is an employee of the company. Okay, so just as an employee of a company doesn't have any personal responsibility, neither does a director. But because a director has additional responsibilities, there is the potential for personal liability. So if you are acting illegally or if you are acting fraudulently, then you will have personal liability. And therefore, it might be worth, which is directors and officers insurance. And, and effectively, that protects you as a director from being sued by the company or the creditors for you know, making the wrong decision, for example. Um, typically, DNO insurance will be paid for by the company, you know, especially large companies. The, their directors will have DNO insurance. Um, I would say I'm not necessarily it, it, it's it's a hundred percent worth it, but certainly make sure that you record and minute all of your decisions. If you have a reservation, that's fine. You know, flag it. Say, you know, I'm, I just want it minuted that I'm not a hundred percent sure about this, or I have a disagreement, or I think that this is a big challenge. It's illegal for a company to trade while it's insolvent, okay? So now we can talk about technically insolvent and actually insolvent. So technically insolvent is where your assets are less than your liability. That's like living in a house which is worth half a million dollars um, with a mortgage of a million dollars on it. You're technically insolvent. But actually insolvent means that you can't meet your financial obligations as they fall due. So Donnie, if, if you haven't got any money in the bank and you have to pay your supplier, I don't know, next Friday, and you have to pay them a million dollars and you say oh but ted i know i'm confident i'm going to get a loan from the bank on tuesday therefore i will be able to pay the bill on friday you can argue that you're not insolvent right but if you can't get the loan then you are insolvent so you start to get into this gray area of when are you insolvent and if you're not sure get the lawyers involved make sure you get the lawyers involved get it minute and make sure that you, you're, okay, you're allowed to go bust, Donnie. This is capitalism. It's a healthy thing that happens. Companies do go bust. Just make sure you go bust legally, not illegally, and then it won't come back and bite you. So it is worth just maybe getting a lawyer on board if you're kind of right at that kind of that tipping point and not sure whether you're allowed to enter into a new contract or to continue to trade. And if you are really, you know, just you know, uh, acting illegally, acting fraudulently, then there is the potential that you're going to do time behind bars. So one thing, again, that we've pointed out a couple of times in the videos is that it's probably good to get a lawyer involved, even at, even at a, a, like a, a high level, to just kind of advise you on a, on a few things. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's fairly straightforward to get started and get going, but you might want that kind of um, advice from from a legal entity exactly and, and we talked about you know the, the example of a prenup for example donny that you know just getting in uh, you know and we don't want to spend money on lawyers and, and i like lawyers as much as you do donny which is probably not very much but you know sometimes it's just worth getting a lawyer involved early on because it can mitigate a lot of mess and a lot of heartache and a lot of problems further down the line last thing to talk about then is it's you know some of this looks quite scary and lots of people go oh my god i don't want to be so you can mitigate it. So first of all, monitor the financial uh, situation of your company. So if you're working with a colleague and, and they're the finance expert, you can't say, oh, well, they're the finance expert. I don't have to worry about it. You all have responsibility. So don't be afraid to ask questions, even if you're not quite sure about what questions you should be asking or what the answer is. You know, you've got to educate yourself. You do have to keep asking questions. Take minutes, articulate your reservations. You don't have to be right, but there is this sense of collective responsibility that once the board agrees to execute a certain strategy, you're kind of on board and you have to support that decision. Okay, so you're allowed to you're allowed to debate, 
disagree with each other, but make sure it's admitted and then make sure that you know, you're working together for the benefit of that company. Okay, excellent. Is there, is there, are there, is there anyone who can't be a director in a company? Uh, only if they're debarred. I, I'm not sure about overseas individuals, but certainly here in the UK, it, only, only if you've been banned from being a, a, a director. Right. Okay. So, Donnie, we talked about the responsibilities of a director. I just want to show you this very short clip uh, from a, of a chap called Paul Flowers. And, and this is quite a nice clip because he was the chairman of the co-op bank. Uh, and this is what happens when you get it wrong. So the chairman of the co-op bank, so if you're chairman, you're a non-executive director, you're expected to have a brief overview of the business. You're kind of, you know, you're the guiding force. You've got to know the basics. Uh, and again, we talked about this test of reasonableness. So Donnie, what I want to do is to show you this video clip, and then I want you to think, uh, is it reasonable, his reply to the questions? You know, does he display a reasonable knowledge of his business? He may not know the detail, but does he show that he understands uh, the, the, the basis? Uh, give me a, and give everybody who's listening to this an idea of the size of the co-op bank, roughly, What's, this, what's your total asset value? That's roughly. about just over three billion. I'm talking about the assets, so we're looking I'm at the balance the assets sheet too. I'm talking about the assets and the balance sheet, just over three billion. Those were the figures I've just looked at recently. Okay. Uh, what, what, how many loans did you have out? Um, I would have to ask someone to tell me that. So As a because, proof. Uh, I could not tell you the actual figure, I'm sorry. Okay, but do you know r roughly how many loans and advances you've made to, you'd made to customers at the time you left? Uh, no, because it was not my function as the chair of the board to have all those details. They would be details supplied to the committees and in particular to audit, risk and exposure committees. But the loan book is a core, it is indeed. it's the core asset of a bank. And you don't know what that figure is, even roughly? I cannot give you that figure at the moment, but okay. I will come back to you with a note if that would be helpful. Your total assets in June 2013 are listed at about 47 uh, million. Okay. Sorry, 47 billion. Just to give you an idea, you were offering me 3 billion, and I'm telling you that the, the uh, your annual account showed at 47 billion. Indeed they did, forgive me. And your loan book is about 32 billion. These are very basic numbers yes. for the chairman of a bank. Um, so there you go, Donny. Um, I don't know if you catch the numbers, but uh, so he was asked, what are the assets of your, it's obviously a bank. So what are the assets of your uh, business? Uh, he says, oh, I think they're about 3 billion and they're 47 billion. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, this is fundamental. I mean, this is, this is like saying, I don't know what we do, for example. Then he's asked about his loan book. He says, I don't know how big the loan book is. It's like, oh, give me a, give me a rough idea. He says, I have no idea. Yeah. 32 billion okay that's that's enormous i mean that's a bit like tim cook standing up and saying what we make iphones really do we and nobody ever told me that i mean it's just you know this is crazy 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 anyway um i don't know donnie what do you think well is i it, love is, the expression is, is it of the reasonable i love the expression of the guy who's asking the questions because he's just like you you really have no idea what's going on <laughs> yeah it's a look of disbelief donnie isn't it yeah Completely, completely. So, 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 you know, anybody I, looking at this video, don't do that. Basically, the um, <laughs> yeah, basically, yeah. The moral of that story. don't do that. Know what's going on in your business. Absolutely. Okay. Um, couple other things just before we finish, Donny. Uh, so we talked about vesting. So just remember vesting. If you're a director, you may be getting shares, you may be getting share options, you may not be awarded them immediately. And therefore, you may be awarded them at a point in time or when the performance hits a, per a, a certain hurdle. Uh, and the difference between now and when you actually uh, get them is what's known as the vesting period. So effectively, I might say, Donny, come and join me today in my business. And in six months time, I'm going to award you with share options. Okay, so those six months are known as the vesting period until you actually get awarded those share options. Uh, and, you know, I'm trying to encourage loyalty or i might say don if you work really hard and the sales hit 
you know, million dollars a year turnover, uh, then I will uh, give you those share options. So again, I'm, I'm incentivizing performance. Okay, and that's what the vesting period um, really refers to. Just a couple of things, and this is maybe quite UK specific, but you know, if you're keeping your, your you want to keep your personal details private, you can do that. Um, make sure that your your head office is not your home address. So you could use your accountant's address, or you could use a uh, company. For example, there's lots of companies out there which will just allow you to use a kind of a a, a shell office uh, somewhere. Your post will go there, and then they'll just forward it onto you for a small fee. Um, and that means that you can then register your company the head office address will be at that head office uh, that you've chosen and you as a director can put yourself down also at that um, address and that just means that you can keep your own personal uh, private details you know out of the public domain if you so wish um, one is thinking about remuneration so again I, I mentioned this before you are an employee of the business even though you're a director you're still an employee and therefore you you know you take a salary and pay you know the the, the PAY and the national insurance contributions employees employers as well um, alternatively you could take it out as dividends so you can remunerate yourself with dividends you may choose a combination of the two there are tax advantages um, to that but obviously if you have more than one shareholder then dividends is going to be a little bit more difficult um, I came across a colleague of mine um, who used to pay the school fees um, through his business. Uh, paying school fees through the business is, is you're not acting fiduciary. This is where you're starting your personal life and your professional life is starting to merge together. Don't pay school fees, full school fees out of the business account. Pay it out of your personal account. Yeah, so pay, you, pay, yourself, pay yourself the money and then absolutely. pay it out of your personal account. You may want to, you can lend yourself the uh, money. And again, there are rules around that as to how much you, uh, how much you're allowed to lend yourself and how much, um, uh, uh, you know, and, 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 and how quickly it has to be repaid and what's allowed to be outstanding at the end of the year. Um, and those are relatively easy to find either. You can look on Google or you can speak to your accountant about them. So you can lend yourself this money, but you just need to be careful. So the best advice, Donnie, is you've got two credit cards. You've got a personal credit card and you've got a, your, your business credit card. If it's a business expense, it's on the business credit card. And if it's a personal expense, it's on the personal credit card. OK, and just keep the two separate. So, you know, if you're going on holiday, that's a personal expense. If you're going on a business trip, then it's a business expense. So trying to just separate that out, work out which hat you're wearing uh, and you're not going to get tripped up further down the line. And I think that's that's everything um, we're going to talk about, Donnie. Uh, you got any questions on anything we've talked about so far? No, no, no questions today, Ted. I think it was pretty clear and comprehensive. I think, the, you know, I think the, the, for me, the key is to realize that as a director in a company um, and an owner, you have very different roles and, and um, making sure that you understand that. And it's not just like your personal piggy bank, um, you know, behaving that way with, with the company's money. And um, that, that's to me is really, really important for, you know, entrepreneurs to understand. Absolutely. So thanks very much for that. As always, Ted. Well, thanks. Thanks. Good to always speak to you. Uh, always good to speak to you, Donnie. And um, uh, well, it's Friday now, so have a good weekend. Yeah, and you as well. And and for all the viewers, if you, again, as always, if you have any questions, comments, or you want us to answer any questions, put them in the comments, and we'll be happy to do so in the next video. Excellent. Okay. Bye. See you thanks, later, Donnie. Guys. Bye.